Several years ago, my wife Karen and I traveled a few times to Europe and uh, tours related to Florida College or associated with Florida College. And since it's a Bible college, you can imagine it was focused on religious history. And so we saw lots and lots and lots of church buildings all over the cities that we visited in Europe. And they, they were all magnificent and exciting to see, and some of them were anyway. Others were just standard, kind of all kind of ran together as well because the dominating feature in every one of these church buildings is the same one that dominates this one, and that is basically a rectangular building with a pulpit in front because it was uh, designed to provide a, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, it was designed to provide space for people to come together and worship God. That's what this is all about. This is what this building is for. And its purpose then is, and for its purpose, dictates the form that the building takes, the shape that it takes, to provide an opportunity for us to glorify God. In the same way, the purpose or focus of the church, which is to glorify God by transforming sinners into saints, dictates the form or shape of the local congregation. The, form, the purpose of this building dictates its shape, and the purpose of the local church dictates its form or shape. And that's why we're looking at why the church is local, and this morning we're going to look at the idea of the form. Last week we looked at the relationship of the, uh, the focus of the church and how it de uh, determines that, uh, that what the local church does and determines why the church is local. And as we pointed out, it was to glorify God by transforming sinners into saints. But to understand the importance and purpose of the church, the proper form of the local church, we're going to have to start looking at a lot of scriptures. And to do that, we just need to look first of all at the two main purposes of or main uses of the word church in the New Testament. And most of you have heard this. Most of the time you hear the church either universal or local. Those are the two main ways the Bible uses the word church in the New Testament. And universal church basically just talks about the idea of Every Christian, every when, and everywhere. Think about it in those terms. When you talk about the universal church, you're talking about every Christian that's ever lived, everywhere they've lived, and every time that they've lived within. Not just Christians in a specific place or in a specific time frame. When Jesus said, I will build my, on this rock, I will build my church, he was talking about the universal church. And so the universal church's form is simply all faithful believers in Christ from the first century to the 21st century who have built their lives on the rock, who trust and obey Jesus. They build their lives on the rock. All who believe in that rock are a part of the universal church. No one is in the universal church, the universal body of Christ, that is not a faithful believer. God will know all of those who are his. Not only is it made up of all Christians, not all Christians are part of a local congregation. Sometimes that's not possible. Think of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 when he was baptized there on the road. And Paul, uh, Philip baptizes him and then he went on his way rejoicing and Philip went somewhere else. The Ethiopian eunuch was by himself. He was not part of a local congregation until maybe he converted other people down in Ethiopia and started the congregation down there. But the point I'm trying to make is that we are, organ we are all organically connected to every other Christian all over the world. Organically meaning that our life blood is connected to one another because we are all branches on the vine that we talked about in a previous lesson. So Christ is the vine, we are the branches, and that gives us an organic or a living connection to everybody. And so we recognize that we know of Christians all over the world and in many places. But there is no organizational tie binding congregations together. Every church is not bound together organizationally. There's a big difference between organic, our lifeblood flowing from Jesus Christ, and organizational, our, our connection to each other through some gi a giant multi-congregational organization. They do not exist. It's not in the New Testament, and it's not something that we are to be involved in. But when we talk about the universal church, there are a couple of concepts that come up. There are two that, that are errors, that are false ways to see this. 
First mistake is we begin to, and people begin to think global or universal, and what they want to do is they want to create an organization, a global or universal organization tying all the congregations together. And since the Bible is silent on this, then, well, in their mindset, then we can create a, a, any kind of organization we want. Whether it's a two-person, a two-congregation organization or a, a huge conglomerate, corporate, uh, corporate conglomerate like the Catholic Church. The problem is that silence in the scripture does not authorize, in fact, prohibits such organizations. I want to repeat that. Silence in the scripture does not authorize anything. So when we get to the scripture and we get to this uh, thinking in our mind and we start talking and say, well, you know, let's do this. And we can do this because the Bible doesn't say anything about it. That doesn't authorize anything. Sometimes it specifically prohibits doing whatever it is that we might be wanting to do. And that's why I wanted you to go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Look at 2 Samuel 7 because we have God explicitly Stating this very concept. It's not something that we kind of have find illustrations of and then brought reason back to the point. We have the point made specifically by God in 2 Samuel chapter 7. David is in a good place. He, his kingdom is established. He's built his nice palace. And he's sitting there and he's happy and he wants to honor God because... Well, David knows that God is the one who gave him all these things. And so he decides, I want to build a temple. So he calls Nathan the prophet and he says, hey, I want to build a temple for God. I've got this nice house. God needs a nice house too. And Nathan in verse 3, he said, go, do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. Verse 4, though, says, but in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying. And so God came and said, no, David is not going to do this. And I want you to notice his reason. In verse 5, he says, Go and say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have, I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. He's speaking metaphorically. God doesn't live in the tabernacle, but he's connected to it and demonstrates his presence there for their benefit. Verse 7, he says, wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? And so what God is specifically saying is, I never required this. And by implication, when he says, I never required this, he's stating unequivocally that you don't have the authority to do it. That's what he's saying there. I didn't give you the right or the authority or permission to do this. Because he had specified, build a tabernacle, and I will put my presence in that tabernacle and go with you. That's what he authorized. And for David to come along and say, well, let's do something new, something different. It'll glorify God. Isn't that our focus, glorify God? Well, if it's not what God authorized, it cannot glorify God. And so here we have God specifically saying, stating in no, uh, no uncertain terms, I didn't tell you to do this, therefore you don't end up the implication. You don't have permission to do this. He actually gives Solomon permission to do that, but that's another study of a different type. Now turn over to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. In the Hebrew letter, we have the same discussion, the same issue come up in chapter 7 and 8 where the writer is talking about Jesus becoming a high priest. And Jesus was going to become a high priest, become a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was talked about in just a very few passages in the Old Testament. But the point was that he was the type of priesthood that Christ would have. Because Christ could not be a priest under the law of Moses. And he applies this concept of the silence of the scripture there to explain why in chapter 8. In chapter 8 of Hebrews, look at, look at chapter 8. And I want you to notice verses 4 through 6. Speaking of Jesus as a high priest, he says, Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Of course, this is after Christ had ascended to heaven, been resurrected and ascended to heaven, and is serving as king and as a high priest. And he's already stated he is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. He could not be a priest on earth. Why? Since they are, there are those who offer the gifts 
according to the law. Under the law of Moses, there were priests, there were other, the family of Levi, and specifically of the descendants of Aaron. But notice what he says about that law, verse 5, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about, when he was about to erect the tabernacle. See, he said that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So he's establishing the principle. God showed them how to do it. He said, you do it this way. That's the law. That's the way it's to be done. Then in verse 6, talking about Jesus, he says, but now he, that is Christ, has obtained a more excellent ministry. That old law was a copy and a shadow. Jesus is in heaven, ruling, uh, ruling on his throne and serving as the high priest. By as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. And then in verse 7, he begins to describe the new covenant. And what he's saying very clearly is that, what he is telling them is that he, the, the old law said, this is the family that the priests come from. That puts your limit. That says, this is it. Priests come from this family, the, the uh, tribe of Levi and from the family of Aaron. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. Therefore, under the law, he certainly was not of the tribe of Levi. He could not be a high priest. So what happened was God always intended to remove that law and bring in a better covenant with Christ. You see the importance of understanding how silence of the scripture works. And so when we talk about it in terms of local congregations joining together to form multi-congregational organizations, scripture says nothing about that. You can search from Matthew 1 to the end of Revelation, and you will not find a passage talking about super congregational organizations. You'll talk about congregations recognizing each other, sending aid to one another, doing things like that. But you don't ever see, other than the apostle himself, creating an organization that ties these congregations together. That means that we do not have authority to create one. That if we create one, we are creating something that gets outside of the form set by the scripture, set by God himself. Besides, as we pointed out last week, once the organization is created, its focus is no longer on glorifying God by transforming sinners into saints. Its focus becomes the organization itself and sustaining and maintaining and growing that organization's power and authority. And then that's when you get power-hungry men, and sometimes women, getting in there and wanting their hands on that power. And that's something that God has strictly and completely forbidden. Well, that's the first mistake. The second mistake is to think, well, then, if there's no organization at the universal level, then there's no organization at all. None, not even at the local level. That there are only saints, Christians, serving God in their local places, maybe meeting together and having association with one another, but there's no actual organizational unity there. No specific institutional connection like the creation of a local church does create, make. And such thinking is often born out of frustration and in a reaction to the abuse of power by those who are pursuing multi-church or even, even the abuse of power among local leadership. And so some people say, well, since it's abused, then just get rid of the whole thing. That's, that's the old phrase, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Now, I, I recognize that using that expression dates me. Actually, it doesn't date me because that goes back to the old days, back um, before you had running water in the house and you had to bring in buckets of water and you put in a tub of water and you filled it up and then everybody took a bath. And the last one that got a bath was the baby. And then the water was so dirty, the baby disappeared and you just tossed everything out at once. Did anybody here use a, a wash tub like that and still wash like that? I don't see any hands. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, most of us don't do that. All right. What well, you don't throw out the concept of congregational organization just because it gets abused. There are abuses at the local level. But we cannot deny the fact that there is authority for and requirement and, and the demonstrated necessity of local congregational or local church organizations. In fact, the vast majority of the 114 times that the word church is used in the New Testament is in reference to local churches. In fact, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus was the first one that used the word church. In Matthew 16, when he said, on this rock I will build my church. 
And then in Matthew chapter 18, he's talking about church discipline, and he describes a local congregation where you have a person who has sinned, and somebody goes to them and tries to correct it. They won't listen to that person. And then some, they, that person then brings two or three more, and they try to get this person to straighten out, and that person won't straighten out. And then it says you take it to the church. And the church, and if you will not hear the church, so if this person will not hear the church, the church, the congregation, is speaking as one, as a unit, as a whole, instead of just as individual parts. And so we see that Jesus gives his stamp of approval for that, for local congregational organization. And again, Romans 16 talks about a number of local churches. Both Corinthian letters are addressed to the church of God, which is at Corinth, and gives specific instructions to the congregation as a unit and as individuals as well. We can list more, but now let's go to Philippians chapter 1, the passage Kevin read for us a moment ago. Philippians chapter 1, and that's going to be our primary text for discussing the details of local church form. I want you to notice that Paul doesn't use the word church here in verses 1 through 5. So is he talking about a local congregation, a church? Well, of course he is. And he describes them as the saints. And as, uh, as uh, the saints and the overseers and the deacons. And so those would be the three types of people that you have within the local congregation. But I want you to notice verse 5. We'll, we'll come back to those three in just a moment. But I want you to notice verse 5. He's offering prayer on their behalf in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. When he says your participation, he's talking about the group, the congregation itself. And that participation is described in detail in chapter 4 and verse 15. Look over Philippians 4, 15. And Philippians 4, verse 15 says, You yourselves also know, you Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. And that you is singular, referring to the congregation as a whole. Now, some of the members may have sent money to Paul, and in fact, Paul says that they sent money to him when he was down in Thessalonica, just down the road, very early on. It could have been the Philippian jailer who had sent them money. It could have been Lydia who sent them money. But here he's specifying that the church collected funds and then sent that as a whole to the apostle Paul while early on in his work of preaching the gospel. So, back in chapter 1, verse 5, your participation in the gospel. It was not just them supporting him while he was there in Philippi, but them supporting him when he was also in, uh, in Thessalonica and in other places and then even in Rome like many years later. These, this was a very generous, very loving congregation of people who supported Paul's work wherever he went. Now let's go back, let's, let's go back to chapter, or to verse 1 and let's talk about these three types of people within the congregation. The first is saints. Verse 1, it says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. So he's limiting it to that location who are part of the congregation there under these overseers and deacons. And so when we think of saints, don't think of superhero Christians like the Catholic Church uh, says they are. Think individual believers. People like you and me. Fellow Christians. Believers in Jesus Christ. Think of it this way. When you see those names, Sam, Ann, Iris, Nick, Tom, and Sue, so you that's about saints. Think of it this way. Sam has a friend who introduces him to the gospel. He meets, or he meets somebody and, and they teach him the gospel. And Sam becomes a, a baptized believer in Christ, a Christian. He goes home and he teaches his wife Ann about that. He shares that with Ann. Ann then becomes a baptized believer, a Christian, a saint. Then Ann has a friend named Iris, and she tells Iris about the gospel, and Iris becomes a Christian. Chris, Iris has a husband named Nick. Nick be, uh, becomes a Christian. Then Nick has a buddy named Tom, and he tells Tom about the gospel. And then Tom's wife is Sue, and he tells her about the gospel. And the next thing you know, you have six Christians, a, six, three families of Christians in the local area, who then work together and create or form a local congregation. That's the process. That's how it works. And the saints just are people just like you and just like me. Flawed people, yes, but people washed in the blood of Christ. And so that's the local level. At the local level, that is the basic unit of the congregation. Christians, 
Now, overseers and deacons, as we'll point out in a moment, are, are saints themselves. They're not super saints either, and they're not in a separate category from the rest of the Christians. But there are overseers, are people who are officially authorized to supervise or given official supervisory positions in the local church. In the New Testament days, the word supervisor, and even today, is used in that way in civic organizations. And it fits as a description of the work God intended for special leaders in his church to watch over, to look over, and manage and make sure that things go properly. And it's used several times in the New Testament in reference to men who are appointed to the work. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the passage that talks about how when Paul speaking to the elders of the Ephesian church says that, that you were, by the Holy Spirit, were appointed as overseers of this church, the church in Ephesus. And when he says elders there, he calls them elders there, and we'll see later that, that they are elders. It's more than just older men with wisdom and knowledge. It's about men who are given specific leadership authority by the declaration of God here in the scriptures. First Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 calls oversight a good work. And then details the kind of men, the qualities of men that would qualify as overseers. Titus chapter 1 verses 5 through 9 talks about the same thing uh, in uh, several ways. It reaffirms the official nature of the work and the necessary qualities. And Titus adds the word elder in his text when he says that the elders are appointed. Paul directed Titus to appoint elders in every city. So everywhere there was a church, he would go and appoint elders there where he was on the island of Crete. Then later, Peter adds another word, shepherd. So we have elder, we have overseers. Peter adds the word shepherd or pastor. You hear the word pastor used a lot. That's just a word for someone who teaches or in a, in a specific authorized capacity, elders of a local congregation. Look again in 1 Peter, look in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1, he says, Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder, and witness of the suffering of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd or pastor the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid grain, but with a gain, but with eagerness. So he said, and, and by the way, notice that the flock among you. This limits the oversight and their pastoring work to the congregation that they have been appointed as elders over. Verse 3 says that not yet or nor yet is lording it over those allotted to your charge but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd or chief pastor Jesus appears you will, glory, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So you have pastors, elders, overseers, Right, the word overseer is, also, is, also, is the word episcopal. You, you've heard of episcopal church. It's an overseer uh, form of, uh, of organization. And it's from this word that is translated overseer. Elder is presbyter, uh, presbyteros, which is an older person but given specific authority. Heard Presbyterian church. That's where that word comes from. That's where that title comes from. Now, the scripture tells all the saints who are in a congregation that has elders, overseers, elders, that we are to submit to them. And God will judge us for whether or not we submit to this men. But if you look there in 1 Peter chapter 5, they are not given unlimited authority over the local church. They are subject to the will of God and to the congregation the same way every other saint is. They are, they're not given absolute power over the church. Look in 1 Timothy. I didn't reference this passage, but look in 1 Timothy. He talks about elders in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And in verses 19 and 20, he talks about elders, and I will respect for them in, in, in verse 17 and, 12 and 18. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 19. Talking to Timothy, he says, Do not receive an, an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Now that tells us two things. One, that it better come with good evidence. And number two, they can be challenged. They can be called out. 
Verse 20, and he adds, those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. Yeah, I said last week, I don't see local congregations in our lifetime starting to form multi-congregational organizations. But what I am seeing is the second and third generation Christians who are becoming elders who are thinking that they have absolute authority in the local church and they are in charge. God put me in charge of this church. You shut up and submit. I mean, I've heard brethren say almost that exact word. Elders saying, they didn't say shut up. They said, submit and do not talk about this issue. Elders who have been challenged by multiple groups of people within a congregation refuse to hear accusations against themselves and declare themselves innocent without bringing it to the congregation. I know of a church in uh, Texas that has squashed all of the sending voices in that congregation. I know it very well. I have very personal connections to it. And in the last eight years, the dominant elder and his personally picked preacher has run off, they have run off every member and every and even elders who would not submit and go along with their plan and they're bringing in false doctrine. And they don't want to be challenged on it. So they run anybody off that will not agree with them. That is ungodly. Elders have authority, but not absolute authority. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1 and we see the deacons. The last thing we'll look at the deacons. And deacon is just a generic word for someone who serves or ministers in some way. And in Timothy, we see in chapter 3 the discussion of the deacons and their qualifications as well. So there are some who are officially appointed as deacons. Recently, uh, at another church I was uh, part of, they, and watched them, the process of selecting and appointing some deacons. And I was close to a number of the men that were appointed, and I told them very carefully, you got to understand that, you know, they were, they were kind of, what is in the ceremony where we're introduced as deacons? Ridiculous. No, it's not ridiculous. Because you are taking an official position representing this church. And you need to know the gravity of that and recognize that. And be, and be willing to uh, live under with that heavy weight on your shoulders. I wish we had more time, but we're not going to spend any more time on that. What I want to do for the next few minutes is just talk about some necessary inferences, some conclusions that we should draw from these points that we've been looking at. The first one is that not all elders and deacons, or excuse me, let me rephrase, not all saints are elders and deacons. In fact, we have no elders and deacons here, maybe some former elders, maybe some former deacons, but we have none that are officially elders and deacons of this congregation. If we did, they would be subject to the same rules that, that, uh, uh, that, that we are. All elders and, and deacons are saints, and they stand before God's judgment as individuals. Now, what that means, and the point that I'm making from that, is that they cannot stand before God on your behalf. At judgment, each one of us will stand before God and give an account for the things that we did, not for the things that the elders did. And we can't say, well, the elders okayed this, so it's okay for me to go along with this. No, we can't do that. We will give an account to God. So that means we cannot submit to the elders in doing wrong. We need to be very careful about that. And don't be automatically saying, well, I disagree with the elder, therefore he's wrong, and I have a right to... No, no, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is when it's clear. When it's clear that they're doing wrong and are determined to do wrong and will not let anyone challenge them can't submit to that. Just can't do it. Because that makes you a participant in the wrong. And elders don't get to ignore or shut down members to accuse them of sin. It just is not the way local congregations are supposed to work. The second thing, the second necessary inference is that we're baptized into Christ and added to the universal church. Acts 2 and but the Acts 2, uh, 4, verse 47 says that they were added to, or 2, says that they were added together. Those who were baptized were added together. And the King James Version said added to the church. So when we are baptized into Christ, we become a part of the universal church. But we're not, if we're baptized in this baptistry, we're not baptized into the Lilac Road Church of Christ. 
That doesn't automatically make us a member here in the church. We can baptize as a visitor who then is going to go live somewhere else and be a member of the church somewhere else. So you're baptized into Christ. We join the local church by agreement. We become a part of a local church by agreement. Now that doesn't mean you don't that you have to be a, that everybody who attends has to become a member. Hopefully that will take place, but it's joined by mutual agreement. In Acts chapter 9, look at Acts chapter 9. I want you to notice what Paul went through. This is after Paul had been converted, spent several years away from Jerusalem, and when he comes back, what do you think the brethren there in Jerusalem remember? When he wanted to come and be a part of the local congregation. This is the guy that killed some of us, threw us in jail, took our property away from us. No way, Jose, this guy's not coming into our church. In chapter 9, in verse uh, 26, and when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate, some versions say trying to join, trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus and he was with them. So they kept him out. When they found out the fact that he had been truly converted to Christ, they let him in as a part of the congregation, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. So we see an example of a church at first excluding someone who was a Christian, saying, no, 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 you're, you're not welcome here. And then finding out that they were incorrect in bringing him in and accepting him. In 1 Corinthians 5, we won't turn there and read this, but in 1 Corinthians 5, you have the, a member who's living in sin, and the church is just welcoming him. Saying, oh, we're so welcoming, and we're so loving and tolerant. This guy's living in sin. Isn't that great that we can still love him and be, he can be a part of the church? Paul said, kick him out. A member that was being accepted that did not have any right to be there because of sin. And then in 3 John, verses 9 and 10, we'll talk about tonight. I hope you'll come back for that as we cover 3 John. Where John says, Diotrephes kicks out people that won't have that, that follow me. And he's going to answer for that. And so what that tells us is that the local church can make mistakes. There will be people within a, congrega a local congregation that are not thankful to God. They, they can hide it from each other and hide it from their brethren maybe, but God knows. And he's not a part of that kind. He's not a part of God's universal. God also knows that we have to work to figure out who and uh, who is faithful and who is right. And sometimes we will accept some who don't belong. And sometimes we will exclude those who do. It's just a fact of life. That does not mean that we can just absolve ourselves from the responsibility because we don't want to risk getting it wrong. Well, then we're going to let anybody in that's the case. We have to do our a sacred duty of trying to find out whether people are Christians. I said this last week. Baptism is going to become a bigger and bigger issue among churches of Christ because people are going to want to say, well, you know what? If they've gotten wet at some point in the past, we don't want to challenge whether or not it was for the right reason. And we just let anybody in. So we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to discuss it. We have a duty to make those decisions and ask those questions. So by limiting ourselves to the God-authorized form, this local church, the Lilac Road Church of Christ, will glorify God by transforming sinners into saints, transforming ourselves into the kind of saints that God wants us to be, and hopefully by reaching the lost and help turning them from sinners into saints. We'll get your songbook out. We're going to sing a song of invitation after this final question. And that final question is, are you a sinner? And the thing is, only you know the answer to that. You, you may put on a good show. I may put on a good show. But God knows. And each of us will know. Are we following Jesus Christ? If you're not a Christian, then you're not part of his body. You're 
Steve made such a good point. Isn't it wonderful that we have the opportunity to be, to be glorified, to be transformed, to be justified, made free of the guilt of our sins and transformed into the image of Christ? We have that opportunity. If we can help you do that this morning, please come while we stand.